My name's Kip Bobroff. I'm a visiting professor and director of the Law and Indigenous Peoples Program here at the University of New Mexico School of Law. And I would like to welcome you all uh, to the law school for this uh, terrific uh, seminar on the Rama case. Um, it is a, an, a, a special honor to welcome Michael Gross and Brian Rogers here to the law school. Um, for me personally, I got my start as Mike Gross did at DNA People's Legal Services um, in this 50th anniversary year. It's terrific mm -hmm. to recognize uh, some of the attorneys who, who started there. Um, mm -hmm. And there's also a, a family connection. Michael Gross has known my in-laws for about 40 years. And as I introduced my mother-in-law, Anita Pfeiffer, who was part of the same fight for Navajo control of their own schools. Um, as, I, as they were talking, I heard her say to Michael Gross, you were a fighter. Mm. And boy, was he. And we are honored to have him with us and part of it. The other reason that it's a, just a special honor is that I'm teaching first year property this year. And one of my students is a graduate of Pine Hill High School, the school that Michael Gross started representing years and years ago, and that the people of Rama have really built into their own institution. And so having a graduate of that school in our uh, law school is a tremendous uh, honor, and it shows that this work is long and slow, but there is progress. As it says outside the, the law school, the uh, moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And this is a, a part of it today. So um, welcome. And we want to do two things. We want, before we let uh, these good looking gentlemen here speak, first we want to show a uh, video. <coughs> that was taken a, a story on CBS News. NBC. I'm sorry, NBC News <laughs> in June of 1970. Um, and so we're gonna show that video and you will see uh, a slightly younger Michael Gross. Um, and so whenever we're ready to start that, um, here we go. One third of all Indian children in this country each year are taken away from their homes and sent off to federal boarding schools. That's the way the government does it. Indians have never had much choice. Now, maybe they will have a choice because of what is happening here, because of a precedent that is being set here in Rama, New Mexico. Two years ago, this high school was closed. Indian children were forced off to federal boarding schools in Utah, Oklahoma. A young Ivy League lawyer came in and filed a suit on behalf of the Indians of Rama to force the government to reopen the school. Well, he lost the case, but he stayed. He talked with the Indians, and they came up with another plan. If the government would not give them a school in Rama, they would make one themselves. So today, 40 Navajo laborers who would otherwise be unemployed are working. From the wreck of the old school building, they are fashioning a new school. Navajo children of Rama will be able to come home. In fact, the Navajo children of Rama are already home. They will spend the summer here in tents next to the new school, and while workmen finish the building, the students, the Indian leaders who will run the school, will sit down and try to plan what kind of school they want it to be. They know what they don't want. They don't want it to be another white man's school trying to make white men out of Indians. We're going to teach them how to learn their own language and let them learn about the, our history. And, and the only way this school is going to help these children is by have all the parents take part in it to see what their children are learning. And, and to, see that, to see that they will remain Indians. Yes, that's what we want them to be. Mrs. Lorenzo did not finish high school herself. None of the Indian leaders who will be on the school board ever finished high school. Some had no school at all. So they know they need help, and they're getting it. 
For instance, the Robert Kennedy Foundation sent a young volunteer who speaks Navajo. A Harvard-trained anthropologist read about it in a newspaper and came volunteering to teach in the new school. A dozen young people from a dozen places heard and came. The federal government will finance the new school. For the Navajos of Rima, celebrating the other day with fry bread and mutton, this means their children are home. They have their own school. But there's more to it than this, because apparently other Indian communities will be allowed to do the same thing, to get their children home to their own schools. The president is being set here in Rima. Jack Perkins, NBC News, Rima, New Mexico. So the um, results of that work that started then are shown in, in this next young man who's going to speak briefly, Lyman Paul. Um, so if you'll welcome Lyman Paul, a member of our first year class and a graduate of Payne Hill High School. <coughs> Thanks. Um, so again, my name is uh, Lyman Paul. Um, Lyman Paul in Shke, Sen Ma Bethi, Bashishkin, Torechini. I'm Sen Ma Bethi Nishne. Torechini, Bashishkin, Hatso, Dasicheto, Tropa, Hatashina, Ado, Nedischi, Shijoda, Nasha. So uh, my name again is uh, Lyman Paul. Um, and, you know, I'm a product of, of uh, what Michael Gross has, has done. And if not for Michael Gross, I probably would have gone and went to a, a you know a high school somewhere where I wasn't wasn't going to be at home such as you know a, a school like Santa Fe Indian school or or you know a school of, of, of that of that of that type of a of, 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 of school but um <clears throat> but I, I I am proud that uh that, you know I, I I come from um the Raymond community it's a very small community um and it's 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 um, it's 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 run by its own people, and that is the essence of what self determination is, and, and that's the essence of what um, Michael Gross has done has 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 brought to our communities. That that we 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 do govern ourselves, and we do we we had the opportunity to, to teach our own, and I'm a product of that. And the cool thing about like going to school there was like. You know, from like K, I would I would school that's K through 12, um, from K through five. Uh, you know, we had like Navajo language classes, we had Navajo cultural um, uh, time periods within our classes, and then like in med school, we had like um, optional uh, classes we could take in our native language. And in high school, we had optional language, uh, optional classes to take to to study our culture um, and to you know study uh, our language. And the cool thing about it was, uh, you know, we, we did had our own holidays as well that we could implement at our school. So, um, you know, we, we'd always have um, like so Sovereignty Day that, uh, you know, the uh, schools outside the reservation wouldn't celebrate and wouldn't take days off of school. Um, and sometimes uh, we'd have days off for Columbus Day, but that was because everybody else had that day off and we just called that <laughs> Indigenous Day. So. But a lot of us decided we're going to go work anyway because that's not holiday. <laughs> um, but um, I, I am honored and I am happy that uh, that I'm, I'm, I'm a product of of uh, what Michael Gross has done, and you know I, I'm forever grateful. And you know the Raymond community, it's it's I, I feel fortunate that I come from there, and it's a small community. And like small communities. Um, what most people say about small communities is if you drive through Rama and you blink your eye, you'll miss it. Um, and I'm glad that when Michael Gross <coughs> came upon the opportunity to, to work with the Rama Navajo chapter, he didn't blink his eye. Rather, you know, he saw something in it and you know, he decided to work with us and create something you know, as wonderful and beautiful as you know, what we have here today. So welcome everybody. My name is Kevin Washburn. I'm a law professor here. And um, this was sort of my idea to get these two guys together, um, mostly because this case that they won last year is um, one of the most significant cases that any New Mexico lawyers have probably won ever. 
and it's a tremendous tell of persistence. Um, they're going to tell you a little bit about it today. Um, it's my job to sort of introduce them and um, keep them on track. Uh, C. Bryant Rogers, to my left here, is um, a very successful lawyer. Um, in fact, the, the case you're going to hear about today is a Supreme Court victory that happened really in 2012 and then settlement thereafter. Um, but that's not even his only Supreme Court victory in the last five years. He's had one even more recent than that in the Dollar General case um, and um, was not an easy case. And so um, he's practiced most of his career in Indian country. You will not find a more meticulous, detail-oriented, um, he's got kind of a photographic memory for the statutes in this area. He's just an incredible guy. These two lawyers, in some ways, are kind of the odd couple, to be quite honest, because they're very different. <laughs> this is our Harvard grad, and um, with everything that goes along with that, cautious, careful, thoughtful, um, cynical in some ways, um, but um, you know, hooked up early on with Mike Gross, and this really was Mike Gross's case because he was there at the very beginning, um, but they worked together. And Mike is the Yale Law School graduate who's passionate civil rights lawyer, um, you know, the facts be damned, the law be damned, we're going to win this case, and um, they actually worked out to be this incredible team, and I probably, without either one of them, it wouldn't have been successful, but together, they produced a settlement that, we're calling it a $940 million settlement, but it's actually far more significant than that. There were previous interim settlements that take the number above a billion dollars, and because of the legal principles they established, the Indian Health Service also settled for around $850 million, a bunch of cases. And um, the BIA, the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the IHS, started paying contract support costs in the future uh, that is ten millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars more because of the legal principles they established, in essence. And so that's going to benefit Indian country sort of forever. Um, and so it's, it, it, it minimizes this case to call it a $940 million case, if you can believe that. So let's get started. Um, I want to turn it to Mike and just say, Mike, tell us how this case began. Uh, I think I'm going to go home now. Enough's been said uh, about me. Um, I must start by telling you this. Uh, this young man, whom I only met about a week ago, is uh, the proof of the pudding about the persistence of the Rayma Navajo people, who are the, I hate to say it, but they're often called the outcast Navajos. They don't have, at least until recently, their own reservation. They're apart from the mainstream of Navajo uh, reservation people who are headquartered at Window Rock. And uh, they have persevered in their present location they had to get John Collier, the, the uh, Commissioner of Indian Affairs under Franklin Roosevelt, to step in and save them from being removed, like the Muslims are being removed by Trump today, to Big Navajo. They were going to be put on the reservation, uh, and they resisted. Uh, and if anything, the persistence that I've been uh, uh, accused of. Accused of, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Uh, is really a borrowed trait from these people. <clears throat> they have been through thick and thin, and I know that other Indian tribes, uh, it, both near and far, are in dire straits as well, although this act that we're going to talk about has made a huge difference. Uh, but these folks are special. Uh, they live in a special place. They're special people, and I'm just privileged to have worked for you. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I can't let it go by, since my name's been used so often, without talking about the fellow on the far left here. Without him, this case would not have been won. It's as simple as that. I did two wonderful things in my life, and I'm blessed with both. I married this woman sitting here in the front, <laughs> and I divorced that guy over on the left, because <laughs> I used to be partners with him. <clears throat> and then, not personal reasons, I left the firm and went on my own, and ever since, we've been friends. <laughs> so he really contributed an amazing amount 
to this case. It would take the whole rest of the evening to tell you the contributions he's made. And right now, we are distributing the tail end of the 940 million that was, uh, 947 million by the time interest was added, that the government actually paid last August. Uh, amazing. Uh, and uh, Bryant and a fellow named Dan McMeekin, who is working with me, uh, has been working for about 10 years with me, also worked at DNA Law Legal Services uh, about the time I did, and then went with Ted Mitchell to Micronesia to do Micronesian legal uh, services for 10 years. And now I've been fortunate to have both of these fellows uh, as, uh, as colleagues and partners and to help me get myself together and be as straight a good lawyer as these two gentlemen to my left are. Uh, they rein me in, they know the law. That guy over there on the left is a walking law library. Mm -hmm. You can ask him any question on any Indian law subject in many other fields and he will know the answer and the case and the year and the facts and just like that. So I don't have to do any work. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me start this way, uh, first of all, I want the people who are from Rama to stand up, if they can, please. And from Zuni. Zuni Pueblo, I understand, will be here too. They're one of the class uh, representatives. <clears throat> and by the way, I didn't pay them to be here. <laughs> Just want to make that clear. Uh, the thing I'm proudest of in this case is not only are these, these fine tributes, but I know of no class action of this magnitude or any magnitude with this many, many class members, 700, that settled without a single objection, not one. Our first settlement was much lower at $76 million and we had, I forget, seven objections. Uh, which Judge Hansen uh, overturned and approved the settlement. We had a second settlement uh, uh, on a, another issue that was raised in the case for $29 million in 2002. There were no objections to that either. In fact, that was a condition of the settlement. We would have lost the settlement if there was a single objection. So that, that went through too. And then came the big one, the one that Mr. Assistant Secretary presided over at the tail end and whom I give much of the credit for the successful outcome to. Uh, the fates were with us and Kevin Washburn left the deanship here to become the Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs under Obama uh, in 2012, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. 2012, just the point where we had won a five to four victory in the Supreme Court. And we were in settlement talks. These were arduous, arduous talks. These were not easy, and uh, uh, at times there were, we were despairing that we would ever reach an agreement. And he denies any credit that I uh, give him, but in my opinion, having been locked up with him for two or three days at a time, in negotiating over four years, uh, he, he played an instrumental role. In, in getting us this, uh, getting Indian country this victory. So thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Mike, but you're kind of jumping to the end. You gotta start at the beginning. All right. <laughs> um, so some of this stuff I had in my notes here, I, we've already covered, let's see. Uh, we did, this was not the first Rama case to go to the Supreme Court. It may have been mentioned, but in 1981, just as Bryant was joining my firm, I was preparing a, an application for a Supreme Court review of a New Mexico gross receipts tax ruling against us in district court in Santa Fe on, on uh, the proceeds that were earned by a non-Indian construction firm here in, Santa Fe, in Albuquerque called Lemke Construction Company. Uh, the school board had gotten an appropriation through Senator Montoya, whose uh, assistant at the time, well, is here. And can you stand up, Mike? Introduce yourself. <laughs> Bob. Bob. <You're> Mike. <laughs> I'm Mike. You're Bob. <laughs> That's Henry over there, and this is Murgatroyd. <laughs> Bob McNeil. Thank you. He's sitting next to Mike. Browdy. 
Yeah, Mike Rowdy <laughs> played a critical role too. He was uh, on our moot court panel here at the law school before we got, went to the Court of Appeals. Had we not won that case, a two to one decision in our favor, we would never have gotten here. So Mike played a terrific role too, and I'm sorry I confused the names. Uh, where was I? The, so this wasn't your first case. You argued a previous case. Tell us about that. What do you remember about arguing the previous? I, what I remember is very little because <laughs> I didn't sleep a wink for two nights before that. Mm. And I went through the motions. One thing I did remember from that argument was the, the other side was represented by an attorney for the state of New Mexico who had bragged on TV that this was an up and down case. He was going to win because he had just won a similar case three months earlier in a uh, 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 case called, uh, what was it called? I can't remember the I don't remember the name. It was, it was a Sandia, Sandia. Gross receipts tax on the proceeds tax. of those. And the argument was this was money that the government ultimately had to pay and therefore the tax should, uh, the bur burden should, uh, the tax should not be borne on indirectly by the federal government. He won that case nine to nothing, and um, he bragged about it. And then came the oral argument. And I don't know how many of you have seen the, uh, the Supreme Court in operation, but it's a very intimate room. When you're sitting at counsel's table, you're completely oblivious to anything else going on in the world. There are, the, there are these nine faces staring down at you from about four feet away, because that, that dais curves around you, so to speak. It envelops you. And uh, my opponent um, went first. Um, no, I went first, sorry. And we shared our time with the government's lawyer, Louis Claiborne, who was an amazing man himself. I had 15 minutes and I argued. And then came, then came uh, the lawyer for the state. And he was allowed to speak without interruption for 25 minutes. Now, any of you who know Supreme Court practice will, will understand that the, the name of the game is to be able to rapid fire answer these questions that are thrown at you from over here, from over there, and interrupted over here, and you have, to, you have to just, you have to be nimble. Not a single question. Well, there had been a case called White Mountain Apache Tribe versus Bracker, <coughs> and it was on the surface identical facts to our case, except the Self-Determination Act did not govern that case, the Indian Self-Determination Act. So the, my opposing counsel went on and on and on about White Mountain Apache tribe versus Bracker. It was a gross receipts tax case in Arizona for a lumber, I think a lumber Timber. business that the tribe was running. And they were held uh, in the Supreme Court to owe the tax at the end of which Thurgood Marshall, have anybody, any of you ever heard him speak? He was from Baltimore and he spoke with a heavy, it's not quite a Southern African American accent, it's something unique to that area of the, of the mid-Atlantic states. And he, he's a big man and he eventually wrote the decision in our favor. And he reaches over the podium like this and he goes, Oh, I see it now, counsel. That one was called White Mountain Apache. The point being, the only difference in the case was the name. <laughs> <laughs> so we got a chuckle out of that. And then we went on to win the case with the help of the United States. Um, now came the more difficult case where we were against the United States. And technically, suing Kevin Washburn. I hope you didn't take he it He wasn't born yet. My predecessor. <laughs> <laughs> well, eventually he was born, and then eventually he sat across the table from us. <clears throat> and, uh, and that's when get, things got interesting, is, is when we, uh, the, first two, the first two appeals were fairly straightforward, but this one was amazingly uh, difficult. And Brian has a statistic that he might want to interject here. He counted up the number of judges who ruled against our position in the tax case. And what was the number? Well, not at the tax case, in this case, in the Rama case. Let me just summarize a little bit, if I may, 
Well, first I want to say two things. I met Mike in 1975 on the Pine Ridge Reservation when we teamed up to negotiate the first Public Law 93-638 school contract under the new law. And it was quite an amazing experience and I was just right I don't even know if I was out of law school. I think, no, I was still a second year law student. Yeah, but I had worked for four years for the Mississippi Choctaws in charge of their self-determination project to take over the BIA programs five years before 638 came along. So I had some background. Mike had his own history at, at, in, at Rama, And so we teamed up there and we stayed in contact over the years and I later joined him in, in 81. Um, but by the time we got through the earlier settlements in Rama, and we were down to the hardest issue, and, and Congress had put a cap. Uh, no matter what legal theory you came up with to calculate damages, the government kept saying, but Congress intentionally limited the amount of money you can recover. There is no contract obligation to recover more than what Congress appropriated. Congress has the power of the purse. They get to decide. And, and there were a number of cases, the Oglala case, the Babbitt case from the late 90s, where they basically threw, threw these claims out. Then in 2002, I want to read you from the Shoshone-Bannock case. Now this is a case uh, handled by, our, who later became our co-counsel, Lloyd Miller, who's not here tonight, but he joined the, the effort in 2000. Um, and here's what the court said. Because of the express language of the statute and the caps, the caps limited the amount of the appropriation Interior could spend to pay these contract support costs, which is what we were suing about. Because of the express language of the statute and the caps, Congress has plainly excluded the possibility of construing the contract support cost provision as an entitlement that exists independently of whether Congress appropriates money to cover it. The court then relied on yet another statutory provision that BIA had lobbied through after we won some of our earlier rounds, Section 314. And there Congress said the amounts we appropriated in these specified years starting in 94 is all the money that was ever available to cover these claims. The court said 314 is unambiguous. Congress plainly said the appropriated amounts were the total amounts available. Con Congress did not say that it meant only to restrict the secretary's authority to write a check and spend on obligated funds. No, any contractual claim the tribe might have is vitiated by this language. There is simply no IHS obligation to fund contract support costs beyond the appropriations made for that purpose. The Federal Circuit had ruled on that four, uh, two years or three years earlier. Then the Tenth Circuit weighed in in the, in the Cherokee case that later went to the Supreme Court 2002 had said the same thing. Judge Hansen looked at all this and he said, these provisions in the ISDA made clear that the contractual liability of the government is subject to the availability of appropriations and the disbursement of these available funds will be made according to the BIA policies and procedures. Notwithstanding the Cherokee ruling, the Supreme Court noted in Cherokee that a fundamental principle in appropriation law is that where Congress makes a lump sum appropriation, there's arguments called the Ferris Doctrine for getting paid. But the court said, this is Judge Hanson, the obvious implication from the Cherokee case is that where there are legal restrictions on the appropriations, the, the, those appropriations limit the government's liability on the contracts to the amount of those restricted funds. By this point, the Cherokee case had been won by Lloyd Miller, nine to nothing, affirming that these 638 contracts were really contracts. It was, it, was a, it was a great accomplishment. Mike and I had handled a case 10 years earlier where the court said these are not really contracts, the Busby case, and uh, there's a whole story that'll follow from that. Uh, but here's Judge Sanchez. This is a very different scheme. The court is persuaded that there is no contract liability here at all. And that was his ruling. Uh, we appeal that ruling to the Tenth Circuit after briefing in the Tenth Circuit, the Federal Circuit comes down with the Arctic Slope case, IHS analog on the Indian Health Service side. And the Arctic Slope, the Federal Circuit, which is the leading contract circuit in the country, in 2010 says, harking back to the Oglala Sioux case in 99, the Federal Court has ruled that if you have this kind of cap, 
It completely eliminates any argument for contract liability. The Ferris Doctrine that we had argued and lost in the district court does not overcome that. The tribes knew they weren't, there wasn't enough money. They have no argument for contract liability, period. And that's the way it was in the Tenth Circuit, and we won two to one. And by the, the way, circuit. so there were, these are all the obstacles, this, yep. all these cases that where you all lost, right. your argument so, yeah. lost, and John Zavitz there is in the back, and he won his first motion um, before Judge Hansen against you guys, so he was the first obstacle. We could call him the, <laughs> we could call him the speed bump. Um, <coughs> now, yeah. let's back up a little bit, yeah. though. I, I, wanna, I wanna continue. I think, uh, if, if I may, the, the, the nuts and bolts of the legal arguments are, are, of course, important. We wouldn't have won if we hadn't found ways to counter the decisions that Bryant just cited, including Judge Hansen's. And how we did that, we'll probably get to a little bit later, but I think what we're talking about here is really, what is the legal profession all about? And I wanted to spend a minute on that. Uh, there is a school of thought, and I would say the two gentlemen to my left uh, represent a large part of that school of thought in my view. And that is, a client comes to you, he's got a legal problem, you solve the legal problem, and then you go on to the next case. Well, okay, I buy that, that's what lawyers do. We're dealing in a social, political, economic, and cultural, and psychological field here that I never expected. I, I, I took this job on DNA in the war on poverty era when the world was crashing in. We'd had two assassinations of of Martin Luther King, whom I had taken pictures of at Tougaloo College in Mississippi uh, two years before he had graduated. I mean, two years before he was assassinated. Um, I was tutoring incoming freshmen at an historically black college when the Meredith March came through, uh, which helped influence my life uh, in ways I'm still discovering to this day. Um, and, and, and then came uh, Bobby Kennedy. And one of the interesting things about the whole issue we're talking about here, the self-determination, is that I read two books by chance. One was a, uh, a biography of, uh, of Nixon, um, and the other one was about Bobby Kennedy, uh, called The Last Patrician, written by a Yale Law grad I don't know, I, I can't remember his name. His first name was Michael, I remember that. <laughs> but it wasn't me. Every Everybody's name Michael. Michael. <laughs> you, you know, they ran, in World War II, there were shortages of everything, including boys' first names. That's why there's, <laughs> there's so many Michaels with that World War II vintage uh, behind them. Okay. Um, so, Michael, so, so, let me ask you. So, what is... Can you talk a little bit about, and you're, maybe you're getting to that, but the Indian Self-Determination Act, where did it come from? And you're, you, it was right. that, from that era, but where did it come from? And well, what is it? There was a confluence, I'll try to answer it as quickly as I can. There was a confluence of forces in favor of this giant leap forward called Indian Self-Determination. In the history of colonial empires in the world, there has never been such an act before. And without, with, albeit there are limitations and there are problems with it and there's going to always be the overhanging reality that this is only a law of Congress which can be rescinded any day uh, or amended. The fact is there is no colonial empire on earth that has treated native peoples, in, at least in the recent history, with this kind of concept that they should be able to run their own lives and still get federal or government help in honor of their treaties, in fulfillment of their treaties, but this act. I don't know of another country in the earth that has that kind of a framework. Uh, not Canada, not New Zealand, not Australia, although they're more progressive than other colonial empires were. South Africa also. Uh, this act is unique in the world, uh, and that credit needs to be extended to all the people that helped with bringing it about, including the Rama people. Uh, and including Nixon. And the interesting thing about these, this confluence of these two personalities was that they had the same philosophy of how to deal with poverty. 
LBJ. And they were, one was a liberal Democrat, was, at least he wasn't really that liberal, but he was on the <laughs> left side of the political spectrum. The other was on the f extreme right side, at least to some people's thinking. But they thought in the same way. Remember revenue th sharing and what that was? That was giving federal money to municipalities and states to do with what they wished so that they could develop their own and solve their own problems as they saw fit. Well, that concept is what the Self-Determination Act is all about. Mm -hmm. now, Bobby Kennedy ran against the grain of his own family. Jack and Ted had different political philosophies. Bobby Kennedy ran for president when he was brutally murdered in June of 1968, just before I got to Windorock and was assigned to this obscure community which had just lost its, own, its high school. I'll get to that in a minute. But Bobby Kennedy, and according to this book, believed in private enterprise. He was not a welfare nut. He was not, I, don't, I, I use that term from the book. He was, not, he was not a leftist in that sense. He developed the concept of community development corporations, businesses. He was so, trying to sell that in Bedford-Stuyvesant in Brooklyn when he got assassinated. Remember, he was a senator from New York. And that concept died with him in many ways. It's, it, there are flashes here and there, but the Indian Self-Determination Act embodies that philosophy. And Nixon had uh, uh, two aides, John Ehrlichman, you all know, and the image he has in your minds is probably uh, filled with Watergate. And he was, a, he was a friend of ours. He moved to Santa Fe. We got to know him through the second person who was a Yale Law School grad named Bobby Green Kilberg. And she's still a friend. She has a house in Tasuki. She lives in the DC suburbs in Northern yeah. Virginia. <coughs> she's a Republican. And she was doing a paper on Indian education the year that I was struggling to get this school reopened in Raymond, my first case, and not doing well. We had a wonderful judge named Frank Zinn a country judge with a, with a New Mexico twang I, that I can't mimic. And he was a decent, kind man. Uh, I had another case, a child custody case, about Indian kids that had been raised for six years by a foster family in Gallup, but the state had never had a hearing for them to, to legitimize that, that custody. And the parents came to me one day and said, I'd like you to, I, we'd like to get our kids back. Would you help? So I filed a lawsuit, and we had a one-day trial and uh, put on all kinds of evidence about how the parents were going to take care of the kids when they got back and this and that and the other. And I said, and by the way, here's a case that the Supreme Court just decided called Armstrong, Armstrong versus Mazo. And I don't, I, don't, I don't remember the facts exactly, but it was right on point. And uh, Judge Zinn, at the end of the afternoon, after a long day of this intense testimony, uh, expert witnesses, everything else about how the Navajo family, even though the father was drinking and so forth, and the, the, the grandparents were there in the compound near Tohatchee, they would take care, everything would be fine. And he excused himself when I handed him this case. He came back about 15 minutes later, and the first thing he did was yell at me. He said, why didn't you show me this case before I went the whole day long <coughs> hearing? And then, then he laid into the, uh, the lawyer for the uh, defendant state agency, who was the local uh, county attorney, I guess. And he, and he leaned over. These judges like to lean over their diocese. <laughs> and he went like this to this man. He said, I don't want to see another one of these cases ever again in my courtroom. And he said, this case by the Supreme Court decides the case in the family's favor and I helped bring the little girls home. And then the records were lost in a fire at DNA Legal Services. And yeah. But in a sense, we're still working on the same case that I was assigned to. That school closing case took many turns, twists, ups and downs. And the one thing I will say about, about practicing law is that if you don't have the confidence of your clients, you're never going to succeed. These people trusted me. We've had fights. I'm not trying to belittle, make, make life sound like you know, it's all goodwill all the time. No, we've had lots of arguments, and uh, I'm not going to go into any of that now, but the fact of it is when it came to this 
basic issue of running their own lives and getting the federal money to deal with, to, to, to run them, called self-determination contracting. They were behind it. And that's why we got zero objections. Let, let, me, so, let me jump in a minute. Um, so the act was passed, I believe, in 75. And it was a follow-up from um, Nixon's effort to get to approve the secure approval of the Blue Lake return to Taos Pueblo. It, it got him focused on doing something for Indians and the aides that Mike's talking about and others worked to get this act passed. It allows any tribe to force the government to allow the tribes to take over these programs and it provides the same money the BIA would have had to run them. The problem is the BIA, when they run them, Bureau of Indian Affairs, they have lots of other federal apparatus to support that operation, so that it's not only the program money. So contract support cost was added in as a necessary element, recognize that you have to have an audit. Well, you don't pay that with program money. You have to hire lawyers to do legal advice. You have to pay other kinds of costs that the program, the police force, or the school just would not pay out of their program budget. But that's all the money the tribes got at the time. Later, the BIA recognized that there was something called indirect cost that could be used to add money. It's a, it's a rate system, add money based on the amount of the program. The, there were many problems when they implemented it. In fact, a lot of tribes went in the hole because of the way that system worked for 13 years. And there were many twists and turns. I mentioned the Busby Bank that, that Mike and I, Busby case that Mike and I handled trying to enforce rights. There were other suits for Alamo, Navajo that we, where we tried to enforce rights and back in the 80s and the 90s. And one case in particular, um, the Alamo Navajo School Board, similarly situated to Rama, had a, had a 638 contract, is the contract, and it said they're gonna get paid indirect cost on top of that contract. It's in the contract. And based on their rate that they had negotiated with the government auditors. Well, the Secretary of the Interior decided that he didn't like this whole system anymore, and he just promulgated memos that said, we're not doing this anymore. We're gonna institutionalize grandfathering. We're gonna grandfather everybody in at the amount of indirect cost they got last year, no matter what changes. Well, we had a contract. And they just said, we can just override it. It's not really a contract, okay? Um, and he had a little clause that said, but if you can show that your rate, there was a problem with it, we'll grandfather you at the higher rate. Well, the government auditors agreed with Alamo that their rate was not, the rate they were using was not proper. It should have been 42% instead of 14, because they had a big construction project that skewed it. Okay, I'm not gonna go too much longer. We had a big negotiation session. The government lawyer, gets up and says to the school board, no podunk little Indian school from Magdalena, New Mexico is gonna tell the Secretary of the Interior how to calculate indirect costs. I will tell you that fueled me for six years. <laughs> <laughs> and what we did, we enforced that contract. We I went and got the Senate to pass a amendments 88 amendments to the act. There were other people working on these amendments, but I got two parts of it. I got a statute that says we can sue the government in U.S. District Court. There is no minimum or maximum amount of money. We can get mandamus relief. We can get injunctive relief. We can force the contract, the government to award the contract. We can force them to fund the contract, and we can use the Contract Disputes Act as part of the remedy. In the Busby case, the court had said that we handled earlier, you can't use that. That jurisdictional provision, 450M-1, is what allowed us to do the Rama lawsuit later. But one of the, and I want to say one more thing about why were we able to do this all this time? I wrote, wrote a couple of notes. And the, the, Mike and I, are, are we, we disagree a lot on strategy and No, philosophy. we don't. <laughs> <laughs> but we agree on a couple of things really that are really cr critical. Throughout this case, we were absolutely convinced we were right and the government was wrong in being wholly arbitrary and unreasonable the way they interpreted this statute. They're supposed to interpret these statutes in favor of the Indians and against the government when there's a reasonable alternative interpretation. Mike won that case in the first appeal. The court rejected Chevron deference and said, if it's ambiguous and the Indians uh, offer a reasonable interpretation, that's the one we're gonna go with. But we were really angry 
deep-seated angry at the government throughout this whole thing for being so pig-headed and arrogant and condescending and unreasonable. They didn't have to take this position. We'll talk a little bit more about why do they take this position. The other thing is, look, we had multiple, I had lots of other tribal clients besides Rama. They needed this money. They needed it really bad, and the government was withholding it for no good reason that we could see, and it really pissed us off. I mean, that's a real part of why we were able to do this for 26 years. We weren't <laughs> getting paid for most of that time. We got some interim payments for some of the settlements, but not, not, nothing like what it took to get this done. And we had a, our team, and, and this was greatly aided when, when Lloyd Miller came in. After I got the 88 amendments, Lloyd came in, and he was very instrumental in getting the 94 amendments, so it strengthened our claims. These amendments commanded the secretary to add the full amount of contract support costs needed to administer these programs. Commanded that. And direct contract support costs. Yeah. And, and then added another category of contract support costs called direct contract support, which the government never honored, never paid a dime on until we got a, we did an equitable relief settlement after our second monetary settlement. It took eight years to negotiate that. We, we reformed the indirect cost rate system, made them change the way they calculated the rates and adjusted them. We didn't solve everything, but we, we saved the tribes a lot of money with that equitable relief settlement. And for the first time, the government was ordered to pay direct contract support costs. And they kept saying, but we don't have any money. We, we can't even pay full indirect costs, much less this new category of direct contract support costs. We said, you do have the money. It's in the judgment fund. The Interior Department, I mean the Treasury Department, administers a pre permanent and indefinite appropriation. It's available to pay judgments. Reach agreement with it and you can pay it. They paid the first settlement and the second settlement out of it. And they said, but we didn't, those didn't have caps. Congress has said we can't spend this money. Well, we thought it was frankly wrong, absurd. Why would they stick to this position? I have some thoughts about it. Mike has some thoughts about it. He thinks it's primarily turf. The government did not want to release the reins of power and money because if you pay more money out of a limited appropriation to tribes, you're going to have to reduce your federal bureaucracy. And that's a central uh, thing that was our obstacle. I think there were two other elements. I don't think all the federal employees were malevolent. I think many of them never re-examined their position after they won the first go-around in 1995 or so. They were unwilling to relook at it, no matter what we would throw at them. And every time we would find a little way to get over their argument, they went back to Congress, and three or four times they got the law amended to defeat us. And we found a way to overcome it every time. And it was not easy. The other weird thing I wanted to say is, Bureaucrats don't like to make decisions that have big money consequences. I think a lot of them just said, you know what, we th we're not going to change our mind. The court's going to have to make us do it. And the court did. Well, let, <laughs> let, me, let me pick up at that point with, with, a, with a, a little discussion about Lloyd Miller uh, and his contribution to the case. Uh, Lloyd is a difficult personality. We're all difficult personalities. The three rings Speak for circus, I'll tell you. No, we are. That's true. We, 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 we <laughs> like to think that we're always right, and, and most of the time we're not. And that's why collaboration is so important. What Lloyd brought to the case was strategy. Um, first of all, he represented a tribe in Oklahoma called the Cherokees. And, and he had the same kind of claim. Uh, he wanted to bring the same kind of claim against the Indian Health Service that Brian and I did on the Bureau of Indian Affairs side. Well, by the way, side note, I debated with Bryant at the beginning of the case that went to the Supreme Court the wisdom of joining the Indian Health Service to the case. Uh, Rama has two entities that can handle 638 contracts. Mm. 638 is the, is the number of the bill that passed and became the Indian Self-Determination Act. So for shorthand, we call it 638. Um, and uh, they have a health clinic at the school board side of it. Many of the school board people are here in the, in the audience and stood up earlier. Um, so why not join them in the same case? Well, the reason was because the psychology of the agencies, BIA on the one side and the Indian Health Service on the other, 
are diametrically opposed. There is a guilty conscience within the BIA that, could, that, that I call it that because I think it really is a psychological trait that people who work for the BIA inherit from their forebears. The BIA staff helped bring about the Indian Self-Determination Act from the bowels of that old building on Constitution Avenue. Bill King and people like that developed the concept and then sold it to OEO and then sold it to Congress. And then they managed to get Louis Bruce, the Commission of Indian Affairs, to go along and so forth. They were underneath, they never get credit for anything. <laughs> and, and, and here it is, they were allies, uh, not so on the IHS side. And Kevin can carry on with that. He's got a story to tell. Maybe <laughs> at some point we'll, 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 let, we'll give him a chance to say a few words. Uh, so that's one thing. Now, Lloyd's strategy was this. He divided the Cherokee case that he had, same issues, between the non-cap years and the cap years. And he sued first with the non-cap years. And they were easier to win because there was no limitation in the law, the Appropriations Act, saying not to exceed X dollars for contract support costs, which we had to battle later on. He had the, just the general appropriation to work with, and he won a nine to nothing decision in the U.S. of eight to nothing. Nine to nothing. Rank, eight to nothing. Rehnquist was sick. Yeah. Uh, so it was eight to nothing. He won in the Supreme Court on that lesser. Uh, I call it the easier issue. He knew it was easier. He did that purposely. And then he filed the lawsuit for Cherokee against IHS. We had the same, the Rayma case on, against the BIA on the same issue. He, he tried to get the Cherokee Zuni, he, case. He did it for Zuni on the BIA one, I think. I'm sorry? Zuni. Oh, yeah, Zuni. well, Lloyd represented the Zuni tribe here in New Mexico. On the BIA I mean, side, it was Zuni he sued. Yes, before. correct, correct. Yeah. But the Cherokee case was his alone. IHS. Against IHS, and uh, he started with that case, and then he divided it between, and he, and he actually was in the Fifth Circuit on that second case, the one about uh, the caps. Remember? It was, uh, I can't remember the name of the Thompson? case. Thompson? He went to, he tried to get certain in that case, the same time we did in the Rayma case, and we, we, we got the Rayma case accepted. So Mike, let's talk about that. So you filed this case in 1991, the Rayma case? 1992? 90. 90. No, 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 wait a minute. The case was filed in 1989. 1989. Yeah, right. And okay. for three years it languished because the district judge in Santa Fe at the time never did a thing in the case until Leroy Hansen became the judge. Okay. And he moved the case along. That one thing you have to say about Judge Hansen, despite the fact that he ruled against us on the merits. <laughs> on the merits every time. <laughs> he was entitled to his, as you heard from Brian, he was in the mainstream. Mm -hmm. yeah. but I, saw him, I saw him a week ago, and he said, boy, that is the statute is really tough, and I still think I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, he wrote several opinions that we had to get reversed in the, in the Tenth Circuit, but he moved the case along. One thing you want if you're a litigator is get your case heard as quickly as you can. That's, that's the bane of practicing law is getting on the docket. I had another case for Rama against the Indian Health Service, uh, a federal court case, I won't mention the judge, who sat on a, this case even though the statute said that in this sort of case you have to move everything aside on your docket and hear this case right away. Four years it took. Four years until we had a trial and by that time the case had gotten murky and uh, we won anyway, but it would have been so much easier had th this judge uh, ruled the way the statute required right away. So if you're blessed with a Judge Hansen, you're going to get heard, and yeah. that's the main thing. Mike, I want to mention one other case that... Uh, well, can I finish the oh, point about go Lloyd? Ahead. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So he divided the kind of case in, into two parts, and then... Um, um, let me get the thread again. Uh, he brought the harder... Well, he, he look, he, what cap. he came up with is a strategy of trying to get the Chamber of Commerce, when we, when we get to oh, the rain yes, case, of course, the Chamber the of Commerce and the National Defense Contractors Association to file an amicus brief in our on our behalf. And they did that because the arguments the government was making were making them very uncomfortable. If these are really contracts and they're really enforceable as contracts, so, they ought to be enforced. And they got concerned about it. We got them on our side and it got us Scalia and Thomas votes. Yeah. That's the bottom line. Now, we managed to slip into the brief that was written by a firm in Washington, D.C. that 
had assisted in the Cherokee case that Lloyd had handled. Yeah. And they had a brilliant lawyer who argued about 85 cases in the Supreme Court, winning half of them, which is an amazing track record. And, and we gave him the argument. I, I, it was my call, and I said, well, he's got this track record with the court. And, uh, and you even, said, been there, done that. I've already argued before the Supreme Court. I don't need another case. Well, I almost, no, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the, po the point was that the strategy was to argue the case strictly on contract law. Federal contract law that applies to uh, Lockheed Martin or, or uh, the, the plumbing firm that comes in to fix the Sandia uh, uh, agency, I mean, the, uh, let's say the BIA facility uh, plumbing, mm. they're all under this Contract Disputes Act. And he persuaded Bryant and me that that should be the lead argument but it wasn't the only argument. We still use the Indian Trust Doctrine and the Ambiguity Doctrine. Yes, which but the, court the brief, the brief that got times. written in the Supreme Court had one mention of a statute where the contrast in wording worked to our favor, and that yeah. was cited in the Supreme Court decision. It's 25 U.S.C. 2008 D at the time. That was the codification. And it basically applied a different rule to contracts uh, with schools then applied to the uh, basic Title I, 638 Indian Self-Determination Act contracts we were litigating under. And that contrast mm. in the wording of the statute was used by Justice Sotomayor in her decision. And that was a big, big plus. We found 51 statutes where if you wrote the statute a certain way, the contract liability was clearly curtailed by the lack of appropriations, especially when Congress says, you, you know, out of this, you shall not spend more than this for, for that, for, to meet that obligation. ISTA didn't have any language like that. We made that contrast and it, and it really helped. Uh, no, no. I want to mention a case that, that I had to do in the middle of this because I want to tell you how far the government will go to win. Uh, the, uh, I represented Mississippi Choctaw. They're one of the con uh, grant schools. They're in a particular category of grant schools that also get some indirect cost on their, on their school grants. Most don't. Rama doesn't. There's a peculiar history behind that. But in any event, the government just screwed up and failed to pay them the amount that everybody else, everybody else for those years got 84% of their indirect cost. Our whole case has been about the 20, 20% percent, or maybe it should have been a little higher because of the miscalculation claim that Mike first won. But everybody else got the 84%. They got nothing. And we sued in the, contract, in the Board of Contract Appeals. Why did we get nothing? Because they're, they're, they had a new contracting officer. He screwed up and just didn't include them in the pot. In the pot. Okay. So we said, well, there's a mistake here. You know, you have to honor their, they have a right to this money. No, the caps make it illegal for us to pay you because we've already spent the whole appropriation. I, I said, come on. All right. We're in a Board of Contract Appeals. These are interior appointed administrative law judges. The solicitor's office, which handles these cases in the Board of Contract Appeals, wrote a brief that told the judge, you work for the Interior Department. If you rule for the tribe in this case, you will be prosecuted for violating the Anti-Deficiency Act. Talk about a due process violation. Talk about a desperate <laughs> effort to win. This judge is the same judge that ruled for us in Alamo, and he also ruled for us in the Oglala case that, that Mike prevailed on in, in the 90s uh, that was later reversed by the Federal Circuit. Judge Perrette, who was a great guy, he's, he's deceased now, but he just told him, look, I'm a judge and I'm gonna rule on this on the merits, and he ruled for us, and that you know, led to where we are. But the government was so fixated on being right and winning, they lost sight of the trustee's role I don't, I mean, it's just really, it's really sad when they get so burrowed into a position that they're not willing to re-examine it. I do credit Kevin the same way Mike does for bringing a different perspective at the end when we were desperately trying to negotiate this settlement. For three and a half years, I will tell you there were about 20 material, serious differences in our positions on law and fact that were never resolved in the negotiation. Unbelievable amount of detail and, and, and crap we had to work through and statisticians and, 
government contract lawyers and procurement people and all this stuff to try to get to a number. Um, ultimately, we did. And you want to tell the yeah, so story? Yeah, so just to finish up yeah. and, um, and then do some Q&A and we won't hold people hostage any longer. But um, so I got in the government. I, I was um, appointed, I, I, you know, confirmed by the Senate in September of 2012. These guys had won the Supreme Court case in the summer of 2012. And in fact, I was in Washington. I was meeting with Senator Udall. I was the dean of the law school. I heard about the case, so I walked over to the Supreme Court building and I got a slip copy of the opinion. And then I called Mike and called Bryant and congratulated them both because it was an unbelievable victory that no one thought that they would win because they'd mm. lost so many times before. <laughs> Seven <laughs> times. <laughs> I called <coughs> them and congratulated them and, um, and told Senator Udall about it. It was this great victory for these you know, Mexico lawyers. And then I, suddenly I find myself in the government. And um, this case, they had won it. They'd won it on liability, and it just remained to determine what the damages were. And so I got into the government, and the first meeting I went to um, was, uh, was with, uh, actually, OMB, um, who d figures out the budget, and Department of Justice, and the IHS was there, and some White House staff. And um, they had come up with this plan for the next year's budget to avoid paying contract support costs, even though these guys had just won the case in the US Supreme Court. And my deputy thereafter, I'd been a month on the job, and I'd go to the White House meeting where we start talking about this stuff, and my deputy forever after called it the F-bomb meeting because I, really, <laughs> I lost my cool really badly. I couldn't believe. So that the attitude was, we can still avoid paying these contract support costs even because the Supreme Court kind of gave us this loophole that we can use. And the Justice Department said, and furthermore, they just won on liability. We can drag the damages phase out for years, and they're the plaintiffs. They have the burden of proving their damages, and they don't have the documents to do it. So they may not get anything, even though they won on liability. And again, I, I was really aggressive in the meeting, and I ultimately I lost. And I lost in part because the IHS director at the time, she didn't want to pay contract support costs. She'd been fighting this for years, and she'd been in the job four years. I'd been in the job one month. Her budget was about five billion dollars. My budget was two point three billion dollars. In the, in the in, you know in clout, she sort of was heavier, and and DOJ agreed with her, and OMB agreed with her because they didn't want to pay any money either, and she actually said in the meeting, the director of the IHS, she said, Kevin, your problem is you think tribes are our friends, <laughs> and I was what, I was, a, what I was, a trustee. <laughs> I was dumbfounded, and I turned to my deputy, and I said, if you ever hear that come out of my mouth, that means it's time for me to quit. But just send me home if I ever say that our constituents yeah. are not our friends. And I lost the, I lost the battle. But and, the tribes um, were able to out-lobby the Bureau and IHS to prevent that yeah. end run around the court case. I, I, and I, after that, Congress has appropriated almost 100% of the need. So we've actually collected another, I don't mm -hmm. know. Well, for both agencies, millions. we've now tripled yeah. The amount that right. we got settled. I want, uh, but but let, let I him want, tell I, the one story about the, the hundred million. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So the so the, so at any rate, I the good news is I went to Jim Cole, the de deputy attorney general, and I said, and he would settled the Cobell case, and I said, Jim, we didn't learn anything here. We settled the Cobell case, but we're doing the same old tricks from from the Cobell Cobell case to fight these guys, and that's just not who we want to be. We're the Obama administration. And luckily, the assistant attorney general um, for the civil division was one of my law school classmates. And I went to him, too. And so just sort of worked the people we knew and kind of got the career people turned around at the Justice Department. So they were interested in, much more interested in working through settlement. Got to settlement. We end up, I, these guys insisted that I be brought to the, to the Table. settlement discussions. I wonder why. <laughs> And so the judge actually ordered that I appear, and um, Karen Molson did the mediation. And so we all, I got to come back to Albuquerque. I got to fly to Albuquerque with the Justice Department lawyers, and Karen Molson, Molson started this, this settlement mediation. And um, we went back and forth all day, and about 6 o'clock or something like that in the evening, it was late in the afternoon, evening, she comes in to my side. I'm in with the government, and she said, I've got good news. We're only one hundred million dollars apart. <laughs> <laughs> we and started she, about five hundred million apart. Yeah. 
and <coughs> she laughed and she said, I'd never imagine a world where that would be good news. But at any rate, but then we, we closed the gap and we got to a settlement yeah. um, and, yeah. um, and that, was, that was sort of that. And it's, these guys are still working it through, but, um, but we got to settlement that day. And the, and the funny thing after that was we, then we announced it at a press conference a few weeks later, um, had a hearing. And um, the thing that kept coming to my mind was the Winston Churchill quote, the United States always does the right thing after it's exhausted every other option. <laughs> and uh, the justice, I said that to the, in the press conference and the Justice Department lawyers were just gritting their teeth. <laughs> they were really mad about it. But it just seemed, it seemed like the right answer. So that was, that was it. These guys, you know, won one of the biggest victories in, in Indian law um, with this case. I, um, I want to, if I may, I, I know we want some time for questions too, don't we? Yeah, so maybe uh, some I want to end with one note. Uh, they say that you don't learn what your case is all about until you get to the Supreme Court. I disagree. You don't learn about the case until your dying breath. And that's true for me, and I think it's true for all of us. It was after the Supreme Court decision in our favor, one vote, in June of 2012, that I was going around Indian country, and I remember going to, uh, uh, what's the, the Sioux Tribes organization called? Great Plains. Great Plains Tribal, Tribal yeah. Chairman's Association yeah. meeting in that following February 2013, and I was trying to explain the decision to them. And I, I did an okay job, I think. Uh, they obviously were happy with the outcome. And on the plane ride back to Albuquerque, or maybe it was even later, I don't remember the exact time. I, I think it was in discussion with Dan McMeekin, who I talked to about five times every day about all aspects of the case. And suddenly, I had a flash. You know, I was trying to explain this case to a group of lawyers uh, uh, one time in DC, and I got all completely bollocked up, and, and they, they left the meeting, and they, they, they scratched their heads. What, was, what is this case all about? And finally, one word occurred to me in conversation with Dan, and it just popped out, parity. The Indian Self-Determination Act guarantees that tribes that are qualified and wish to run their own federally funded Indian programs can run their programs in parity with the federal government. And for all these years, I was trying to figure out ways to describe this concept but you read, the record, you read the legislative history, the word never appears, but the concept that runs throughout all the hearing reports, the testimony, everything was to enable tribes to fulfill the federal obligation themselves to Indians under treaties, moral suasion, and the passage of time and precedent that is, undergirds what we call Indian law to this day. Parity, and my, parity. And the parity point is, if the gov if BIA's got $100,000 to run this police force, that's not all the money they have. They have the solicitor's department. They have the uh, civil service system. They always have the, all the support apparatus. Well, if the tribe gets $100,000, tries to run the run program with that, they're going to be running a much smaller program because they've got to take money out to pay for audits and lawyers and all that stuff, you know, workers' comp and yeah. unemployment and comp. That's what this case is about, is to get that extra money so they can run the same scale of program without, you know, without diminishing it. Now you're witnessing how our minds work together. Because what triggered, what, what, he just, what Brian just said triggered another thought. The big, basic defense by the government was when they said, well, we, can't, we don't have the money to pay you with full contract support costs. This was during the cap years. Uh, because we have in, inherent federal functions to perform. We are trustees. And we are these lofty people. Getting paid. Wait, 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 let, me, let, me, let me wax eloquent for just a okay. tiny second. I'm agreeing with you. Yeah, I know you are. This is how we do this. We have dozens of phone calls a week in this vein all the time. Uh, and we're best of friends. So the point of, the point of it is, just like Trump is all our best friends, right? <laughs> No, that's a big distinction here. Uh, so inherent federal functions was the excuse given to Congress about why the Bureau of Indian Affairs and IHS could never give 100% of contract support costs to tribes. Well, 
you don't think there's any other inherent, and they were you know, saying we have to monitor contracts, we have to do all this, it's a trust. Well, you don't think other federal agencies don't have to monitor federal funds that are contracted out? Half the federal budget is contracted, is contracted out to yeah. Lockheed and GE and the man in the moon. Yeah. And they, oh, I, here's an anecdote. Maybe we can add none of this. I got one more I got to tell, though. <laughs> All right. Let me, let me, you get one yours. More. My anecdote. In the early days, before the act was, uh, was uh, let's see, the act was passed in uh, 89. This was back in the 70s before the act was passed. Yeah. And I was representing uh, an Indian education parents group in Wyoming on the Wind River Reservation. And around that, their efforts, the Coalition of Indian Control School Boards came into being through my suggestion that for 10 years blazed a trail of Indians helping Indians at the grassroots level get, uh, get their funding from Congress. And um, um, now I've lost the point. <laughs> my mind You've is given me an the, opportunity. Uh, what? No, You've the, given me an opportunity to jump yeah, in. Yeah, I'll, I'll remember it in just a second. Right. Okay, I just want to say one more thing about the, the, the kind of arguments you run into here that are just insane. In that Alamo case I talked about earlier, this is a little school. They had no other money but what they got from the federal government. They weren't getting their indirect costs paid at the full amount they needed. They couldn't afford to incur the full range of costs they needed to administer the program. So when we sued for the, to recover, the government's defense was, we didn't spend the money. It's a cost reimbursable contract. You didn't incur the cost, so you have no remedy. Well, we didn't incur the cost because you didn't give us the money. <laughs> That's called the prevention doctrine. There's a federal circuit ruling on that a long it's, time it's ago. Basic you can't contract prevent, law. Huh? Basic contract yeah, law. Yeah, you can't prevent somebody from performing and say you didn't perform, I'm not going to yeah, pay you. Right. Well, anyway, we well, got that in the legislative history of Congress that they can't make that argument. And we got in the 88 amendments, it became, a, as Mike says, a fixed price contract. It's not how, what we spent, right. it's what you owe us. All the right, opportunity here, to spend. Here's the, here's the, here's the anecdote. We're, we're in Washington, D.C. in this commissioner's office, and we're sitting around trying to get this contract for Wind River signed before the Indian Self-Determination Act was passed on the Rama model. And uh, we got a full-page article written by William Grider in the Washington Post that helped put us over the top. So we were in the contract drafting phase, and the government, the BIA in Washington, said they needed a few days to prepare the contract. And they came out when we went back for the next appointment with them with this contract. It was about half an inch, maybe three quarters of an inch thick. And I just took one look at that and I said, uh, would you get the state of Arizona Johnson O'Malley contract out for me, please? Johnson O'Malley is a law that has been on the books a long time that uh, allowed um, states and others to run their programs under contracts too. They didn't have all the protections that the Self-Determination Act has, but it was, it was a vehicle for the federal government to give public schools money to, for special programs for Indian education. A few minutes later, the, 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 uh, the official that I had asked came back. The thing was, <laughs> you couldn't see it sideways. That's how, that's how <laughs> small it was. I think it was actually three pages, and it was for, I'm, I'm guessing now, but it was in the millions of dollars given by the federal government to the state of Arizona with no strings attached, basically. And here comes this $50,000 contract for the Wind River Indian Education Association, newly formed parent group, which I incorporated for them in, in, in uh, Wyoming. And they had a half to three quarters of an inch contract to wade through. Uh, I, I, a similar incident happened in Anadarko Area Office. There was an area yeah. director there I was doing a contract for the Cheyenne Arapaho tribes. I went down to get the contract, uh, which he said he needed time to develop. And I walked into his office in uh, Anadarko. Uh, I've never been back to Anadarko, but uh, <laughs> it's in western, uh, southwestern uh, Oklahoma. And he had it on his desk. It was literally this thick, but it was big and it was thin enough for me to take it and go like that, <laughs> throw it in the wastebasket and left. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> we need to open this up for Q&A, but let me first just say that that parity principle that uh, Mike talked about, tribes never had it since 1975 when this bill 
was enacted and it was always intended to be there. They never had it until these two guys and Lloyd Miller up in Alaska delivered it to tribes. So let's give them a round of applause for that. <laughs> Now, we'll ha let's, let's take a few questions. I again, I don't want to hold people hostages. You, we're in a lot more comfortable chairs than you guys are. Um, so, yes, sir. Uh, could you tell me, with respect to the settlement, are there any restrictions on the funds that, that the tribes have to abide by? Do they have to use it for contract support costs, or do they use it for any purpose whatsoever? It's money any, damages. Any purpose. Money Any legal purpose. They can't, they can't abscond with the money and pay the tribal council to go to Hawaii on a vacation. They can use it for any legal purpose that the tribe establishes as a legal purpose. It's unrestricted. And we, by the way, our class has a website. It's called rncsettlement.com, www.rnc for Raymond Navajo Chapter, settlement.com. Question and answers. And the very last question is that very point. Uh, a lot of tribes uh, have called uh, desperate to know the answer to this question, are we allowed to use our settlement money to uh, pay per capita? Most tribal governments don't want to do that because they realize the money if given out you know, in, ch in small chunks to all members of the tribe will disappear and won't be able to be used. This is one-time money that will never appear in our lifetimes again to be used for any legitimate government purpose. So most tribal governments want to husband the money rightfully so in our view, but we can't legally tell that, uh, that they can't pay, pay it out as per capita. And so we have a question and answer that's artfully crafted on this point, saying you can use it for any lawful purpose. And because tribes aren't taxable entities, none of it's taxable either. It's not taxable IRS. Joe. Yeah, as, as to that point too, I've got a tribal client. Uh, th those monies, are they distributed through a different source? And they don't, they're not coming through the feds, are they? I'm sorry, what the, was the, the settlement monies, they're not being distributed by the feds, are they? No, or you have no, a separate are, settlement fund? We're distributing we're the, we're distributing the money. Okay, I need to give you our bill. We just got it, so we just, we're trying to figure out how to, who do we collect the money from? So. The, the, like a very important aspect of this settlement was we did something, we learned something in the first two settlements. The first two settlements, we had a, we had a percentage mechanism worked out, a methodology worked out, but we didn't have the data to calculate everybody's shares. And it took several years after those settlements to get the numbers. We had to publish, we had to give everybody a chance to correct errors and object and do all this stuff. This time we had the court pre-approve everybody's percentage share based on a very complex statistical analysis with government had statisticians, we had statisticians. We had a database that they worked from, we extrapolated for the whole class and people could object to their percentage and then we gave them an estimated dollar amount too that would either you know, be adjusted by attorney's fees and by interest and all this stuff. We got no objections, but the point being, you can't come back and say, we should have gotten more. You had a chance to object, nobody objected. Preset numbers, it's allowed us to get the money out very quickly. The court finally gave us authority to start distributing in August we distributed 98% of the money already. We've got a few outliers that we can't identify. They don't exist anymore. We have a few that are fighting over who's the tribal leader, so we had to do interpleaders. But 98% of the money is out there. One, one final, final, final last word. Uh, this law school has played a terrific role in our case mm. because of the personal contacts I've made with the professors here, including Kevin. Uh, Mike Browdy and several others, M. Hall's here, uh, and several others. Sam Deloria is not lo no longer with the uh, uh, pre-law program for Indians, but I understand he's on the board of uh, trustees of it. And I must say that uh, I have benefited personally from these contacts, but I think Indian country has as well. Well, we did a we did a moot court before the Tenth Circuit that UNM helped put together, and that was very helpful in getting Mike prepared. Well, we, we had that. Dick Bossen and yep. Mike Browdy and um, who uh, was Lee the, Bergen, I think. Lee was, Bergen was Is the Lee third here? one. Yeah. Okay, I I thought he was coming. Lee Bergen is a private attorney. Sir, I'm sorry. Sure, this one, the one with where he has black hair. See what this case did to him. Yes, we can. I'm sure we can probably provide that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we yeah. It's it's not copyrighted. Um, 
I don't, <laughs> what, I don't know what the law is in terms of NBC News, where it came from. It appeared mysteriously in the mail one day. I'm serious. And as far as I'm concerned, anybody can have it. <laughs> um, how to get it to you is a question. I think, uh, well, the law can, school has it. We can get it. in touch with us. We can figure that out. Yeah. Law school has it now. Mr. Slade. I'm wondering if Bryant would comment on the division within the Supreme Court in the decision. It's one of the weirder ones I've seen with Scalia and Thomas joining Sotomayor, Kennedy, and Kagan, maybe. How did, how did that division <clears throat> arise? Well, look, the most difficult and the surprising part was Breyer. He wrote the 8-0 opinion in favor of Cherokee. And he would not rule for the tribes here. The caps just, he could not get over the caps. And, and there, was, uh, there was languages in opinion where you could interpret it either way, uh, that maybe there was wriggle room for the caps, but there was another way to read that opinion that says if there were legislative caps, he wouldn't have ruled in favor of the tribes. And that was, the, that was one piece of it that went one way. Scalia and Thomas, as I said, we got their vote because of the Chamber of Commerce and the defense contractors. There, there was no way they would have voted for Indians. I did a, an analysis of their vote, uh, all the justices for the federal bar last year over the last 25 years. Thomas and Scalia have hardly ever voted for an Indian matter. This was a, I mean, critical. I mean, we would have lost without those two votes. And, and that's why Lloyd's strategy was absolutely. so important. Absolutely. Uh, uh, I mean, we always had that idea. argument in our briefing. But Lloyd insisted, and we went along, that it be the lead argument. It turned out to be essentially the only argument, although mention was made of, of some of the others. The ambiguity region. doctrine helped us a little bit. I want to give one anecdote about the Supreme Court, because this, <laughs> for all the lawyers <clears throat> who may practice in any court, this is so important. Um, we had a wonderful man argue the case for us. But he was asked a question on that case that uh, Brian uh, mentioned, the Cherokee case, which Breyer wrote. In Breyer's decision, he cited two old cases, Ferris and Dougherty, which lay the groundwork for federal contract law that's been followed ever since, that contractors, if there's no, no other qualifications, are entitled to get paid if they perform their services. That's the basic law of contracts everywhere. Even if the appropriation's not big enough, if now, they've done the work. there was another citation behind Ferris and Daugherty that Breyer himself had written or uh, cited in his Cherokee decision twice called New York Airways, a more recent case, 1950s case if I'm, I recall, about a helicopter mail delivery service in New York. Didn't even have a written contract. It was an implied contract and the only guidance was the appropriations language in the hearing record about the appropriation. I mean, gee whiz, our case was 20 times better than that in terms of what was in the law and the legislative history. And reasons we don't understand, Breyer asked um, a question. And to know, to understand this question, one, one further point. There is a handbook of four volumes called the Red Book that, ca that uh, compiles all federal contract cases. It's updated every few years. We were using the volume, the, the edition from, I guess, 2010 or 2012, maybe it was even 2011. And I had written a long, not a long, but I, I mean, it was about two pages description of this New York Airways case for the lawyer who argued our case. And when Breyer asked his question, he went, he went something like this. He said, show me in the red book where you win. Show me the sentence where you win. And he hadn't read it. Our guy hadn't read it. And Breyer got angry. He asked the same question with a higher tone of voice, screaming at him uh, uh, four times, as I call, counted it. We kept passing and, notes. Yeah, Brian and I were sitting next to each other trying, <coughs> trying to get New York, New York Airways, Airways. New York Airways. New York Airways. He never, he never could answer it. And until Scalia interrupted and saved our arguer's neck and brought a halt to uh, Breyer's tirade. I mean, he was livid. He was very angry. He was very yeah. angry, and the very case that he cited, 
Breyer cited twice in Cherokee had the answer that would have just settled it. It wasn't a one sentence in the Red Book. It was one case that he, Breyer, had cited twice. That's how, you know, I, the, our theory about it, and, and Justice uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg also voted against us. And she has a reputation for siding with the government. <laughs> and so we lost, I mean, we lost four of the five, uh, nine justices. Fortunately, Scalia saved the day and rescued our arguer and also the case. Yeah. Yeah. So. Mm. Uh, by the way, old cases really matter. In this, the Ferris case, the Doherty case is over here against us. The Ferris case is over here. They're both from the 1800s. They're not even U.S. Supreme Court cases. But those were the dominant. The court had to pick which, which road to go down, and they picked the one we wanted, which was Ferris. And the, and the ambiguity doctrine and statute helped us because the court said, this, when you read all this, the caps and everything, there is a way to interpret them that was not intended to cut off the contract liability and the ambiguity doctrine helped with that. The ambiguity doctrine is embedded in the statute. It's not just the canon of construction, it's actually a statutory provision here and that helped us get over it. Again, the Ferris case was the, uh, the Ferris doctrine was the primary argument and that was the one that got the Chamber of Commerce into defense because they don't have the ambiguity doctrine. But they were worried about this, and thank God they joined us, and you know, sometimes it works. So, so to, to, to summarize the whole thing, two words, tenacity and luck. I was gonna say <laughs> providence, but. <laughs> <laughs> so um, these gentlemen um, have shown their persistence that they've exhibited for years, so thank you, gentlemen. All right, uh, one last thing, we actually like to extend a little gratitude um, on behalf of the law school community, uh, NALSA, and our native students. We wanna thank uh, Professor and former Dean, Kevin Washburn, Michael Gross, and C, uh, Brian, C, uh, Roger, Brian Rogers. Brian Rogers. Yeah, sorry about that, I got, I'll get that right. Um, and as a token of our gratitude, we'd like to uh, ask you guys to accept these gifts. Oh, thank you, thank oh, boy. you. Thank you. Oh <laughs> and we would also like to recognize the very generous and significant um, support that Mr. Gross and his wife, Andy, has shown to the law school, and in particular, uh, Native students. Um, the very generous gift um, is going to impact uh, the success, our, our success, basically, in law school. Uh, in addition, it's going to um, also instill in us, in any student that's fortunate enough to benefit from their generosity, uh, the inspiration to pursue our own self-determination. Um, and again, thank you. thank you. It's up to him now. It's up to him now. Thank you. Good luck to you. And these gentlemen really will stay here and talk all night about this, so stick around if you want to come ask them questions. Um,